Good morning friends! In this video I'm going to tell you how dietary protein ages you. But before I do, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, like the video and comment on the video to help with the channel's growth. Now let's get started. First of all, I want to apologize to the audience for my delay in making this video. I've been a little bit distracted by some issues in the household, planning to move, my wife's sister coming to visit us and some other things like that. Also, I was a little bit delayed in making this video because sometimes when I try to make a video about a subject that I'm very interested in, I become a little bit too comprehensive and then realize it can't fit into one video. And so at some point I realized I should make a series on protein and then I realized we made enough series and these are very, you know, they're not very attractive to the audience. So I had a bit of difficulty deciding what to include in this video and how to organize these videos. It had to be more than one video for sure. So what I decided to do, I think, is I'm gonna make three videos. The first video is this one. This one talks about how protein ages us specifically at the amino acid level. We'll get back to that in a second. The next video talks about some practical implications of this knowledge. How can we apply this in our own lives? And then the third video, what I'm gonna do there is, I made a post on my Instagram asking which questions you guys have specifically with regard to how protein ages us. What I'm thinking of doing is making a video in which I go through all those questions and answer them one by one, and so that way we can take care of the audience's interests that were not covered in the original videos. Now about this video, Protein consumption affects many signaling pathways in the body, not just the ones I'm about to mention. I had to decide which pathways I wanted to mention in this video. I decided on mTOR, a major growth pathway, and the GCN2, FGF21, UCP1 pathway, which affects metabolic health. I chose the second pathway as an example of a very different pathway that's also nutrient sensing and affected by our protein intake and affects our health. There are other pathways that are influential, as I said, but I picked these two. I also decided to really drill into the molecular effects at the amino acid level, meaning what every amino acid, the constituents of protein, does to affect these growth pathways exactly. This hasn't really been done on video before, to my knowledge. In fact, there is no single academic paper that unites all of these individual amino acid effects on both mTOR and the GCN2 pathway. So this is the first one that does that. The reason why I wanted to do that here is so that you guys see at an amino acid level that something is really happening here. And also we'll review some observational studies on how really higher protein diets affect the health in humans. Now let's get started. First of all, what is dietary restriction? Dietary restriction can include caloric restriction, whereby you restrict the total calories in a diet, or it can include macronutrient restriction, like protein restriction, or in fact, even individual amino acids of that protein. It can also restrict nutrients for specific times, like the fasting mimicking diets, or uh, periodic fasting rather, or also the uh, time-restricted eating. Dietary restriction was first thought to be known to extend lifespan in the early early 20th century, with some studies actually beginning in, on fish, including both caloric restriction and later protein restriction. But in reality, the first time we can find this in history is from an Italian nobleman who lived in the 1500s and late 1400s. This nobleman lived a life of excess until 35, and then upon doctor's recommendation began to live a very restrictive life with caloric restriction. He lived to extremely advanced age. This is the first recorded uh, incident of it in history. But in, as I said, in the 20th century, there were studies done on organisms that showed that caloric restriction and also protein restriction extended lifespan. Now in caloric restriction, calories are usually reduced by about 40% from their normal average to maintain weight. In protein restriction, protein is reduced by a similar amount. Now, U.S. governmental guidelines advise the population to consume about 10 to 35% of their diet from protein. That restriction of that amount by about 40% produces this protein reduction, this kind of nutrient uh, dietary restriction that we're about to talk about. Now, as I said, in the early 20th century, studies on fish showed that protein restriction extended the life of these fish. In the 1930s, studies on rodents showed the same thing, but showed interestingly that restricting protein not only reduced the size of the rodents, but also their longevity. This was the birth of the growth and longevity trade-off. In fact, although I won't get into it here, protein restriction even in the earliest uh, years, the earliest months or days of a rodent's life has impacts on its lifespan. So even not allowing the rodent to develop fully due to nutrient reduction can still extend rodents' lives. 
but we won't get too much into that here. Maybe we'll do a separate video on that regarding childhood development later. Now, despite these initially intriguing results, poor methodology caused this not to be followed up on too much until 2005, when the study of protein restriction began again in earnest. Later, it was shown through restriction of both the protein in the diets of flies and in rodents that reduction of protein in the diet extended lifespan across species study. By the way, what they use here is called nutritional geometry. That means the proportion of macronutrients in a diet. It's called nutritional geometry, just FYI, in case you come across that term. Now, to be clear, in rodents, restricting their dietary protein by 40% produces a similar but smaller effect on lifespan extension as caloric restriction by 40%. That is not replicable with any other restriction of macronutrient groups. It cannot be replaced by a restriction of just carbohydrates or fats. Only protein can almost mimic the effects of total caloric restriction. Now in this video, we want to talk about how dietary protein affects two pathways. The first one is called mTOR, the mechanistic or mammalian target of rapamycin. It is an interesting name, and its name comes from its very intriguing history, which is that in the early 1970s, a pharmaceutical employee named Segal, who was of uh, subcontinental origin, I think Indian, discovered the molecule rapamycin in the soil of an island called Rapa Nui, which is why it was called rapamycin. Later, rapamycin was discovered to have antifungal effects and growth prohibiting effects and other effects and, and immunosuppressive effects as well. And it was discovered to be a molecule that inhibited a gene transcription pathway that was later called the mechanistic or mammalian target of rapamycin, mTOR. One of the leading researchers on mTOR is a man named Sabatini, if you'd like to look into it. He works in the East Coast, I'm not sure at which university. mTOR has two complexes, mTOR complex 1, mTOR 1, and mTOR 2. Although mTOR 2 is involved in lifespan and aging in animals, it hasn't been shown to be as involved in humans. The inhibition of mTOR 2 may not be desirable for lifespan extension in humans, but the inhibition of mTOR 1 causes lifespan extension across all organisms studied. In fact, mTOR was first shown to govern the longevity of non-vertebrates in 2001. mTOR is a nutrient sensing pathway. You see, your body has gene transcription pathways that decide which genes your cells decide to transcribe at any given moment, according to whether your body senses that you're in a fed state or a nutrient deprived state. That's why some drugs that extend life are called fasting mimetic drugs. They make your body think that you're deprived of nutrients. These drugs include rapamycin and include metformin, for example. These nutrient sensing pathways go beyond mTOR. There are downstream ones. There are various nutrient sensing pathways, such as AMP kinase, that we won't get into here. But the most powerful one of all is mTOR, which is why I wanted to center our discussion around mTOR. Now, mTOR modulation affects all of the nine agreed upon hallmarks of aging. We'll survey a couple of them here, beginning with stem cell development. You see, the activity of stem cells, the ability to birth new cells in adulthood, is impaired in aging. And treatment with rapamycin in some rodent studies improves the function of stem cells. Also, as we age, we experience worsened mitochondrial function, called mitochondrial dysfunction. That is partially due to reduced autophagy of dysfunctional mitochondria. Autophagy is a recycling process by which our body recycles proteins. And autophagy of mitochondria is called mitophagy. When mTORC1 is overactive as we age, mitophagy is inhibited, leading to enhanced dysfunctional mitochondria over time. This mitochondrial dysfunction causes more stem cell dysfunction and also contributes to the inflammation that accompanies aging, often called inflammaging. Also, as we age, though, we have problems in the homeostasis of proteins, leading to us having misfolded proteins that contribute to diseases of aging like Alzheimer's disease. mTOR modulates the management of proteins called proteostasis at several points. For example, it modulates the unfolded protein response, UPR, also at se through several mechanisms. In addition to the unfolded protein response, mTOR governs protein synthesis. This is the way, if you've heard, uh, if you're a person interested in weightlifting, or muscle mass, if you've heard that steroids increase protein synthesis, this is how, mTOR. mTOR activates protein synthesis, but mTOR also inhibits autophagy of proteins, and M mTOR inhibits the degradation of proteins through non-autophagy-related mechanisms. So mTOR really governs this 
uh, dynamic of pro uh, protein homeostasis in aging and worsens it as we age. Finally, let's talk about senescent cells. For those that don't know, our cells divide throughout our lifetimes until they reach what's called the Hayflick limit, a dead end in cell division, at which point they either die or they turn into senescent cells. Senescence is therefore governed both by replication, but also separately by stress done to these cells. The more stress a cell encounters through its lifetime, the more likely it is to become senescent at any point, or the more likely the Hayflick limit is to be made more close to the present time for that cell's uh, you know, lifetime. So basically cells over time become senescent. Senescent cells function bizarrely causing a kind of uh, inflammatory signaling through something called the SASP. The SASP, and by the way, interestingly, even though some people only have two to 3% of their cells being senescent, these cells contribute majorly to the pain and discomfort felt during aging. In fact, it's thought to be that if you kill all of the senescent cells in an elderly person, most of their daily pain will go away. So a lot of it is governed actually not by not having cartilage and joints and so on, but by the activity of senescent cells. These senescent cells require mTOR to have this activity through the SASP. So for example, these senescent cells are insensitive to amino acid nutrient sensing, meaning they completely turn on mTOR even when leucine and methionine, as we'll talk about later, are not in the diet and the person's not in a fed state. mTOR also inhibits the degradation of the SASP signaling and rapamycin can inhibit the activation of SASP. So here all we have to remember really is that senescent cells rely on mTOR to continue their signaling. In fact, they rely on mTOR even to continue existing. And mTOR in general, its inhibition reduces the activity of senescent cells and their birth. Next, I want to briefly comment on the relation of caloric restriction and protein restriction diets to inhibiting mTOR and their increases on lifespan. So for example, rapamycin added to a calorically restricted diet potentiates the effect of caloric restriction on longevity. It increases it. There's a kind of synergy. Rapamycin by itself doesn't completely inhibit mTORC1. Fasting may inhibit it more completely or caloric restrictions in this example may inhibit it more completely. So there, that may explain one of the reasons that caloric restriction has differential effects on lifespan extension than rapamycin does. It also may be that there are non-mTOR dependent effects from caloric restriction that extend lifespan. So rapamycin may not completely do the mTOR effect of caloric restriction and there may be other effects of caloric restriction. Protein restriction seems to inhibit mTORC1, but not mTORC2. So what am I really saying here? Caloric restriction extends lifespan partially because it inactivates mTOR. Protein restriction also inactivates mTOR, and that is partially the reason why it extends lifespan. And it extends lifespan less so than caloric restriction. That's all we have to know here. mTOR is very much involved in caloric restriction, fasting, nutrient restriction. All these things impact on lifespan. Next, what I'd like to do is show you how each amino acid activates mTOR. The amino acids are the constituents of protein. There are, by the way, varieties of groupings of amino acids. There are a lot of amino acids, some rarer than others. Then there are some called essential amino acids, which we need to consume. We can't make ourselves. There are nine of those. And then there are three branch chain amino acids. Oftentimes people supplement with either protein, like whey protein, which contains a lot of amino acids, or essential amino acids, which contain the nine, or branch chain amino acids, which contain leucine, isoleucine, and valine. So we're first going to talk about how these amino acids activate mTOR specifically, and then we'll talk about one of the downstream pathways of mTOR that governs our health, that you may have heard of before, called IGF-1. Let's start with amino acids. First of all, the most important one, leucine activates, leucine is an amino acid. It activates mTOR through at least two pathways. It requires requires its amino acid transporter to do this, which is SLC38 something, and leucine activates mTOR through Cestrin2 and Cestrin2 uh, independent mechanisms through LRSs. There's at least two mechanisms thought to be by which leucine activates mTOR potently. Second, methionine is a very potent activator of mTOR. Methionine is one of the reasons that animal protein heavy diets are thought to age us faster and thought to increase mTOR and IGF-1 more. Methionine plays a role in our methylation cycle. It appears to be the case that it's not methionine directly, but methionine products like 
SAMe or homocysteine that may be activating mTOR. And this may be a reason that we should talk about maybe now that high dosed glycine supplementation, which has been shown to extend life in rats and various rodent strains, may extend life by reducing the impact of these methionine waste products to affect mTOR. High dose glycine does this. Low dose glycine may activate mTOR, but there's a differential impact of high dose glycine. Check out my Instagram stories saved under amino acids if you'd like a link to a paper on this subject. There are two more amino acids we need to talk about with regard to mTOR1 activation. One is glutamine. Glutamine uh, affects mTOR1 activation through ARF1 GTPase as well as VATPase. Arginine, on the other hand, affects mTOR1 activation through a couple of mechanisms. It act, or not activation, it affects its activation and directly uh, impacts its deactivation. Arginine activates mTOR1 via the RAG LAMTOR VATPase pathway, but it deactivates mTOR via CASTOR1, which modulates the gator complexes. The gator complexes are often involved in the deactivation or inactivation or downregulation of mTOR. Next, let's talk about IGF-1, one of the downstream uh, hormones modulated by mTOR. Actually, IGF-1, well, first of all, IGF-1 has long been known to modulate the health of organisms. IGF-1 modulates mTOR downstream, but the reverse also happens. Now, by 2002, it was shown that in humans, IGF-1 levels were most related to their total caloric intake and to their protein intake as a proportion of their calories. It was not associated with the proportion of their calories from carbohydrates, like many people might think, and not associated with the proportion of their total calories from fat, although the proportion of fat, and in particular saturated fat, fat were inversely associated with activity of IGF-1 binding protein 3. So when people consume more saturated fat, they had a little bit freer IGF-1, similar to how African Americans, for example, have genetically. It was also shown in the same year that vegans had lower IGF-1 levels than meat eaters, and that this was likely due to the reduced amino acid content from the vegan diet, such as reduced methionine and leucine. It was also shown that vegans had higher amounts of IGF-1 binding proteins 1 and 2, which is a different expression than the IGF-1 binding protein 3 reduction. They have differential, almost opposing impacts. So as you can see, these studies on humans match the molecular studies that we were looking at, showing that leucine and methionine seem to activate mTOR. We know M mTOR modulates IGF-1. We see that in humans, people with a higher protein diet and higher protein consumption from animal products have higher IGF-1 levels, as we would expect. Next, let's move to the second pathway I wanted to discuss. This pathway is far less important, honestly, but functions quite a bit differently. And very few people have ever talked about this on video. I've never seen a video about it personally, but I'm sure somebody has discussed it before. But the point is we want to talk about the GCN2 pathway that modulates FGF21 and UCP1, which act in coordination with each other. First of all, GCN2 is called General Non-Depressible Control 2. It is an evolutionarily conserved new nutrient sensing pathway across organisms, like mTOR. It modulates part of the stress response pathway in the body. GCN2 governs ATF4, which then governs fibroblast growth factor 21, FGF21, a very important hormone. And inhibition of GCN2 eventually reduces fibroblast growth factor 21 expression. So these two things are related to each other. It's fibroblast growth factor 21, uh, akin to IGF-1 in relation to mTOR, that we really wanna look at here. First of all, FGF-21 is related to longevity. Mice that overexpress they're transgenic mice that are manipulated to overexpress the gene for FGF21, live about 30% longer than mice that are natural. FGF21 is certainly related to our longevity. FGF21's activity in humans, it's a liver-produced hormone, by the way, and the activity in humans mainly governs our metabolism. It improves glucose homeostasis by modulating glucose transporters like GLUT1. It actually inhibits mTORC1 also, so it works opposingly to mTORC1. It improves insulin sensitivity it uh, increases the expression of UCP1, that's uncoupling protein 1. That's the protein that raises from adrenaline that causes your
your fat to turn brown. Check out my video on the cold to learn more about UCP1, but it increases UCP1 in a way that doesn't increase thermic activity, but improves metabolic function as well. Uh, it also reduces the fatty acid synthesis gene expression so that it's harder to develop fat, new fat, and improves the fatty acid oxidation genes that are regulated, for example, by PPAR alpha. So basically what it does is make it harder to create new fat, make it easier to burn fat, make it easier to use glucose, make you less insulin resistant, it improves metabolic health. Now in rodents, but not in humans, fat loss and a diet high in fat both potently raise FGF21. In humans, FGF21 is raised through dietary restriction after four weeks and six weeks by a maximum of about double. It's not as responsive to that. In humans, surprisingly, fructose is a potent uh, upbreak. Well, not that surprisingly, but fructose raises FGF21 expression potently. And in humans, exercise also raises FGF21 by altering circulating glucagon. And in humans, the diet that most raises FGF21 is a diet that's low in protein and high in carbohydrates, actually. Next, let's talk about how amino acids can influence the expression of FGF21. First of all, methionine restriction. Remember, methionine is that amino acid found in high quantity in animal proteins. Methionine restriction seems to reduce FGF21, just like it reduces mTORC1. In humans, in fact, there is a human study reducing methionine showing improved metabolic function, short-term study that's controlled. So there's some evidence to think this is occurring. The likely scenario is that some uh, downstream product from methionine, like homocysteine, is what's affecting mTORC and maybe also affecting FGF21, but it's not completely clear yet. All that's known is a diet low in methionine increases the expression of FGF21 20, uh, in rodents and improves metabolic function in humans as well. Now you'll remember that methionine is involved in something called the methylation cycle. For those of you that don't know, some people have genetic variants that make them poorly able to recycle methionine, causing them to have more of those waste products that activate mTORC1. If you want to know how to deal with this through your diet, actually I can offer you a simple guide here. Supplementation of creatine, choline, and glycine, and methylfolate and methyl B12 can improve this ability to methylate. But anyway, uh, methionine can only donate methyl donors naturally to glycine in our bodies. So there are interestingly some studies, as I mentioned earlier, that show that glycine supplementation in rats and rodents and various rodent strains extend life. This was theorized in, I think, 2011 to be due to the reduced expression of waste products of methionine due to having high dose glycine in the diet. In either case, glycine supplementation lowers mTOR expression in rodents and extends their lives, likely through its modulation of the waste products of methionine, and it may do so also in humans. So one trick to inhibit your mTOR is to, uh, without modulating your methionine is to supplement with high dose glycine. Now, before we move on, I want to mention that supplementation with glycine may also have this or mimic this effect on of low methionine diets on FGF21, but it hasn't been studied yet. As you recall, supplementing with glycine can lower the waste product activity of methionine, so it should potentially have a similar effect. But next we have to talk about the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. This subject has been studied extensively. Only recently it was shown in a fantastic paper, which I quoted on my Instagram. By the way, in that paper, they begin the paper by saying uh, something like, uh, to the effect of recently it's been shown that a calorie isn't a calorie. Now obviously a calorie is a calorie in terms of energy, but a calorie has signaling effects. Unfortunately, it's the fact that in people who have PhDs in nutrition and also in biology, there were some movements like this historically, like Bruce Ames from the triage theory. But these kind of people think of nutrients as building blocks instead of signaling molecules. And so they're very limited to this narrow-minded perspective of calorie in, calorie out. Instead of thinking about this complex uh, signaling mechanisms in the, in the biology of human bodies, which is really how we need to think. But anyway, that excellent paper really discovered the basis of how branched chain amino acids affect uh, FGF21 expression. First of all, it was shown that isolated reduction of leucine, while it didn't necessarily have an impact on FGF21, did worsen lean tissue mass in rodents and also increase both white adipose tissue and visceral fat. So do not isolatedly reduce leucine for metabolic health. 
probably because of the effect on mTOR, but it's also the effect of changing the ratio of isoleucine to leucine, I think, personally. But what they clearly showed was that a reduction of isoleucine, which by the way, isoleucine levels in people's blood has been shown to be associated with worse health, while leucine levels have been shown with the, uh, to have the reverse effect. Anyway, isoleucine levels, it seems to be in rodents at the very least, and probably in humans. Isoleucine levels are what inhibit FGF21 most. So a reduction in isoleucine, and secondarily a reduction in valine, the third branch chain amino acid, increase FGF21, not a reduction in leucine. So the most powerful way through branch chain amino acids to increase FGF21 is to isolatedly reduce isoleucine and valine while keeping leucine the same. Or for example, not supplementing with branch chain amino acids, but instead supplementing with only leucine. That way you've just changed your diet in a way where there's less isoleucine and more leucine. Just that effect seems to cause this FGF21 increase. Now there's only one study in humans of BCA restriction. That's short term, I think it's about four weeks long. It showed improvements in metabolic function, uh, changes in microbiome species activity, reductions in mTOR expression, improved insulin signaling, so improvements in metabolic health, and an increase of FGF21 expression by over 20% if I recall correctly. But this should probably be better if it wasn't a total reduction of BCAAs and was an isolated redu reduction of isoleucine and valine. But in fact, I don't think that the branch chain amino acids reduction is the actual most powerful way to activate FGF21. I think the most powerful way to activate activate FGF21 is a selective reduction of the essential amino acids from a different paper which is sort of a context specific study but I believe that it indicates to us that uh, tryptophan which is an essential amino acid and threonine are the rate limiting steps in increasing FGF21. If you reduce tryptophan and threonine in the normal diet at least in animals uh, it's the most immediate way to increase FGF21, I believe. And also, it's, uh, to a lesser degree, lysine. But we'll focus on tryptophan and threonine. So to review, how can you improve your metabolic function through amino acids, through influencing the expression of GCN2 and the FGF21 UCP1 axis? You can reduce methionine consumption and possibly raise gl glycine consumption considerably. And you can reduce isoleucine and valine consumption. And you can reduce tryptophan and threonine consumption and maybe lysine consumption as well. Next, let's get to our final and most important subject. Does protein consumption actually age us in humans? This is a very difficult question to answer because of the complexity of studying humans in a non-controlled environment. There are studies like this Swedish study or this Finnish study that show that protein consumption is bad or higher protein consumption is bad for our health. In this video, I only want to focus on three studies specifically. The first of the studies we'll review is a 2014 paper that is often cited and also often criticized for its methodology. I find the paper to be I mean, it's a longitudinal study, self-reported on humans, but it uses some very interesting mouse studies to uncover mechanisms, and I find it to be a beautiful paper. I highly recommend you check it out. In this paper, it was shown that it seems to be that humans that consume a higher protein diet that are not elderly, so in this case, they were between the age of 50 and 65, those humans have a 75% increased incidence of mortality. They have a over four times increased incidence of cancer mortality. They have an over, I think, five times inc increased incidence of diabetes mortality. They basically, uh, high protein diets worsen the health of people that are not elderly. In people that are over the age of 65, higher protein diets seem to be protective, but not for diabetes. In this study, very interestingly, they determined that it seems to be that the proteins, using mouse models, it seems to be that the amino acid content of the diet seems to be regulating growth pathways like mTOR and IGF-1 to affect mortality. Interestingly, they found out in in vitro studies where they're looking at cells, that incubating cells with a lot of amino acids caused increased mutation rates in the cells, leading to worse genomic stability only in old cells, but not new cells. So cells from old rodents, not cells from young rodents. So it seems to be as we get older, protein consumption worsens our ability to produce the kind of mutations that can cause cancers. This may indicate that a higher protein diet is more dangerous when we're adults as compared to when we're younger. 
maybe due to epigenetic changes or damage to our bodies and so on. Next, I'd like to talk about another elegant paper from 2016. This paper was a randomized controlled trial in humans of a low protein diet showing that a low protein diet improved metabolic health in people in real life. And to understand the mechanisms at play, they did a companion rodent study. They basically determined what we've already talked about, that total amino acid content is relevant to the metabolic effects, that BCA content is relevant to the metabolic effects, and that leucine to other BCA ratios, not just the actual absolute quantity of leucine, is important to the metabolic effects. It seems to be that there are FGF21 dependent and non-dependent effects at play here. But interestingly, most interestingly of all, all I want you guys to take from this is that fascinatingly here, although lower protein diets increase hunger in these rodents, they reduce their weight gain and improve their metabolic health. And in humans, lower protein diets can improve their metabolic health. Despite what you've heard, I know we all think of low protein diets as being very bad for weight loss and metabolic health, but there are now studies in humans showing that it can be good for metabolic health. Finally, in 2020, the first meta-analysis to study the association of dietary protein and kinds of dietary protein with all cause and cardiovascular mortality was published. In this study, they showed that vegan proteins were positively associated with health, while animal protein consumption was associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. The more animal protein in the diet, the more incidence of mortality from heart disease. The more vegan protein in the diet, the less total mortality and the less mortality from cardiovascular disease. You guys will remember that vegan proteins contain less leucine and methionine, and vegan protein consumption may be an indicator of somebody eating a plant and fruit rich diet in the first place. So it may not be the vegan protein that's protective, but rather eating plants that's protective. And on the other hand, the animal protein may be what's harmful and most likely is the case. Now, before we end, I want to mention what we didn't mention in this video. There are other nutrient sensing pathways like AMP kinase, which is one of my favorite ones. In fact, I own a website called ampkinase.com. I'm very fond of it, but I didn't mention it at all here. So there are other gene transcription pathways that are important, but mTOR is the most important and FGF21 is very important for the metabolic effects of low protein diets. Also, we didn't mention high protein diets effects on kidney health. It is true that higher protein diets put undue stress on the kidneys. We can get into this in more detail in a later video. People will tell you the opposite, but that's not true. I've looked into it a lot myself. So higher protein diets also worsen kidney function, which is a serious concern for people wanting to live to 100, because if you want to live to 100, most people in their 80s have some form of kidney disease. The kidneys don't regenerate, and so we want to lower the progression of this kidney disease that is sort of inevitable and particularly strikes men. Uh, kidney disease is an uh, androgen related kind of disease. Also, we didn't talk about other elements of uh, especially red meat that could be unhealthy. In particular, there's a paper that discovered a few years ago that there's something called TMAO that is produced by our microbiome in response to nutritional choline and nutritional L-carnitine, which are both found in red meat. TMAO amounts in our bloodstream may affect the development of atherosclerotic plaques that are common in heart disease. So that's another aspect of how red meat may be harmful for our diet, for our health, in addition to the effects on growth. And also finally, certain kinds of meat, especially processed meats. So if you're thinking of like uh, sliced deli meats and stuff like that, those are particularly associated with cancer, but for a different reason, because they have high amounts of nitrates and they produce a lot of nitrites and, uh, and nitrose related compounds that are carcinogenic. So deli meats are separately carcinogenic. Red meat also has choline and uh, L-carnitine, so it can produce TMAO in our bodies. Th those are other considerations. And then there's the effect on the kidneys as well. We didn't talk about any of this in this video because those are not the most important effects. The most important thing is what's happening cellularly, the changes in gene transcription in your body. Now to review this video, basically what you need to remember is that caloric restriction extends life across all species. Protein restriction, where caloric restriction is rest restricting calories by about 40%, protein restriction, restricting protein by about 40%, also extends lifespan by a lesser amount, but similar amount, across species studied. 
Also within protein restriction, sorry, it seems to be my video is cutting off because this went too far, but even within protein restriction, methionine restriction or leucine restriction will also extend life. Within that, the main reason that these things extend life is because of a gene transcription pathway called mTOR. Protein is a key activator of mTOR because mTOR is a nutrient sensing pathway. But there are other nutrient sensing pathways like GCN2. mTOR governs downstream hormones like IGF-1, while GCN2 governs downstream hormones like FGF-21. These hormones affect our growth and our metabolic function respectively. Now the way protein affects these pathways is through methionine. Well, let's talk about growth pathways. It activates growth pathways through methionine, through leucine, through arginine, through less amounts of glycine also we should mention maybe, and through glutamine. On the other hand, the FGF21 hormone is upregulated by GCN2 in response to reduced isoleucine and valine, particularly in, res in relation to leucine content, in response to reduced methionine, and in response to reduced tryptophan as well as threonine. Those are the way these amino acids affect mTOR and GCN2 specifically. In the next video, I'm going to try to uh, take away some practical outcomes and put these things into perspective for how this can affect your health and your performance and your decisions in life. I look forward to seeing you guys again this afternoon.